First of all, there was water and wind, the earliest forms of power to drive machinery. Then came steam, and in the 18th and 19th centuries, Britain led the world in harnessing the power of coal, water and steam to drive the engines that revolutionised transport and made mass production possible. The steam engine really is a fascinating thing, and it's actually running it, so it comes alive in a strange way. It has a, an unbelievable smell for a start about it. Even people who come in here now and they go near me boiler, there were an old guy come in the other day, 80 odd years old, and he, and he was sniffing away and he said, that brings back, you know, you memories from my youth, the smell of sort of oil and steam is, a, is, a, is like a, a smell all of its own. It has been said, if you could put it in a bottle and cork it up, you could sell it. Well, it smells that good. The first engines were developed for the draining of mines. And as the 18th century progressed, one invention followed another, allowing manufacturers to increase their output and make Britain prosperous on a scale that no other country could match. By the 19th century, steam power was being adapted to provide revolutionary new means of transport, and Britain saw the development of the world's first railway. It's only within my lifetime that steam locomotives stopped operating on Britain's railways. In this series, I'm going to be looking at the development of the steam engine from the very earliest right up to streamlined locomotives like this. But what exactly is a steam engine? The steam engine really is, is a fairly simple thing. There's two main principles the expansion of steam in a cylinder pushing a piston which is connected to a, a crankshaft or a connecting rod. And the second principle, of course, is the condensation of steam which creates a vacuum in the cylinder which makes it easier for the steam to push the piston along in the cylinder. When you mention steam engines to people today, they think that steam is something from the past. And that's not really true. It's still with us today because what is it that provides the power to generate electricity to drive a train like this? The age of steam isn't dead yet. When industry and transport demanded more and more electricity, it's still the steam turbine that provides all the power right up to this present day. These three power stations, Ferrybridge, Egborough and Drax over there, are capable of supplying 15% of the country's needs for electricity. The reason these three great power stations are here is there's plenty of the stuff that makes them go. Number one, water from the River Ur, and number two, coal, which there's plenty of coal mines in the area. Coal and water raise the steam that turns the huge turbines in here and these turn the electromagnets that generate the electricity. So if it wasn't for the steam, we'd have no electricity. The steam turbine isn't only used for generating electricity. It, it serves dozens of purposes in the world of industry. We're in a very new idea, really. The, the first steam engine came about 2,000 years ago, when we had the first recorded use of steam power. And they were done by a Greek mathematician called Hero of Alexandria. This is a, a model of Hero's, I call it steam whirly gig, but he, he actually did drawings in the first century AD for this creation. Nobody really knows whether he made one or whether it, whether it would work. So we thought we'd make a model and uh, prove that the thing works. And, in some sorts of ways, it's, a, it's actually a turbine without an outer casing. So we'll, we'll give it a whirl and see what happens. Uh, hmm. Whoa! <laughs> he disappeared in a cloud of steam. <laughs> right, basically, on Hero's model, it's had a boiler down at the base of the two vertical pipes with the fire underneath it, and when the water boiled, the steam came up the pipes and it came out into the sphere and then, of course, it came out of the two vent pipes on, on each end, causing it to 
causing it to revolve. I'll just give it a little bit more steam. <laughs> That's incredible. I knew that had happened, you know. <laughs> Where's the copper pipe bit? Well, that rules out any more demonstrations with heroes worldly gig. What a shame. In the ancient world, experiments like this were carried on more as a sort of novelty than anything else. It was another 1,500 years before anybody tried to carry out any serious investigations into steam power. But they only had limited success. The development of the world's first successful steam engine took place in what today would seem a most unlikely place. When you think of Cornwall, or you think of scenic beaches like this and cliffs and all nice things. But for centuries, it was a world-leading place for mining tin and copper. As the demand for tin and copper grew, this meant the miners had got to go further and further down, which, of course, left them with an unbelievable problem, water. The problem of underground seepage plagued the management and the miners alike, cutting into profits and stopping production and claiming lives, especially when the shafts were sunk on the edge of the cliffs near the coast and the workings went out under the water for more than a mile, like this one here at Metallic. A blacksmith from Dartmouth who made tools and bits and pieces for the mines down here in the southwest saw what was going on and he put it into his mind to do something about it. And when he did, he set in motion one of the most crucial developments of the Industrial Revolution. Between 1710 and 1712, Thomas Newcomb had invented a brand new type of steam engine, which was designed solely for one purpose, to pump water from deep mine shafts. The first one was installed here in Staffordshire, to colliery and it proved to be the world's most successful steam engine and of course it was used near here at Dudley Castle for pumping water out of the many coal mines that were in the area. There's actually very few Newcomen pumping engines left and here at the Black Country Living Museum they built a full-size replica with a beautiful engine house. When it's in steam, it gives you a chance to go back to the very beginning of the steam revolution. I mean, when you look at it now, you know, you can see the great beam sticking out the end of the engine house, which in turn works the pump rod down the shaft. And of course, that's attached to the pumps in the bottom of the sump of the mine shaft, which forces the water up the rising main, runs away down the stream or wherever they could get rid of it. Oh, Roger. <laughs> You're You're all right. Right. Yeah, it's not so bad, thanks, Fred. Yeah, this is Roger, who's the chief engineer of this wonderful creation. Uh, go and tell me how it works. He's one of the few men who actually knows how it works. The last time we come, we had a bit of bother with it. So yeah. stop it, Fred, while we're talking. And yeah. Then... Yeah. All right. There is that the brake? Is That's it? the brake, yes, <laughs> and the starting handle. Yeah, you don't seem to turn any taps off, do you, when, to stop the thing? You no, know? it's totally different to a modern yeah, steam yeah, engine. Yeah, yeah. When Newcomen conceived of this engine, there was no boiler technology. The only thing there was was like a giant kettle from the mm -hmm. brewing industry. And that's literally what this is. The original had a copper bottom and a lead mm -hmm. top, which occasionally would melt. Yeah. And the cylinder <laughs> is mounted Whoa, directly above that with a valve. Mm. We turn the steam valve off and inject water, mm. and the cold water condenses the steam mm. and the cycle begins. It's really, even though it looks a bit technical, it's quite simple really, isn't it, how, how it works? It is simple, but it's it must very, very difficult to yeah, engine to keep running. Like, Most yeah. of the work is in keeping the fire right, because you've got yeah. no other controls, you say yeah. no valves yeah. or anything, yeah, so yeah. if the fire's wrong, yeah. it just stops and it'll stop very quickly. Mm. Well, Roger is now going to activate the engine, aren't you, Roger? That's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really, in 1712, this was the cutting edge of technology, you know. Before then... <laughs> <laughs> I do have a water right? problem at times, I have to say. 
Believe it or not, this engine really was a breakthrough. The only other ways they had of raising water from mine workings were either by buckets uh, propelled by horse gins and things like that, or wooden pipes with chains and bits of rag on. So really, this was quite something when it came along. It enabled the miners to go much deeper to get rid of the water. It was called an atmospheric engine because it used the pressure of the atmosphere to move the piston. This is a drawing of Newcomb's atmospheric mine pumping engine. And it's a quite a, an interesting thing, really, how it works. This bit here, of course, is a boiler, which is a simple sort of a boiler, like an A-stack boiler. And the early ones were made of lead, and there weren't a very great deal of pressure in them. And what transpired were the, the steam, when you open this valve here, filled up this cylinder. The cylinder, of course, would be made of brass, then, from this tank up here, the, jet, the cold water, of course, the Edda tank, as you might say, like in, a, in your central heating system at home, came down, the water pressure came down the pipe, and it actually came through this cock here and rushed into the cylinder, condensing the steam, which made a vacuum. And then the atmospheric pressure pressed down the piston to the bottom, activating the great beam, pulling up the pump rods in the mine shaft. And of course, when it got, got to the end of the return stroke, the weight of the rods went down, working the pump at the same time. And that's basically how it worked. In spite of Newcomb's unbelievable success and its worldwide acclaim for these engines, they had a lot of weak points. They've only worked on a few pounds per square inch, and of course, reputed to burn as much as 12 tonnes of coal in a day, so when you took it away from the coal fields, it weren't very efficient at all. What was needed was a more efficient engine, and this is where James Watt came onto the scene. As a young man, he was given a model of a Newcomb engine to repair, and he decided that he could improve on it. In 1769, James Watt came up with the answer. He put together all the existing technology that were known about the steam engine at the time and come up with the revolutionary design, you know, that, of course, earned him the name of the father of the steam engine. One of the best things that he came up with, really, was the, the separate condenser. Before, in the Newcomb system, every time the cold water injected into the cylinder cooled the thing off straight away. But when what moved it outside, I mean, the thing don't look very important, but it's the smaller of the two cylinders down there is, is what's outside condenser. What happened, when the, the stroke had finished, the exhaust comes down these pipes here into the condenser and turned back into, into water again, which had the effect of keeping the cylinder hot all the time. And the other great improvement, they made the cylinder double acting. That meant that they'd had a power stroke each side of the piston, like one for squeezing it down and one for shoving it back up. Some reckon it saved as much as 70% on the coal bill, which must have been incredible. Meanwhile, back here in Cornwall, the unbelievable increased efficiency of the Bolton and Watt pumping engines soon made it that there weren't a Newcomb atmospheric engine left here in the mining areas. But it did another wonderful thing. If you took off the pump rod and put a connecting rod and a crank on, you could make it into a rotary engine whereby you could wind the men a lot, get them down to work a lot faster, and of course bring up the ore as well. This was particularly good news for the miners themselves. You look down into this great chasm here, you can see various flights of stone steps coming up the cliffside. And now in the olden days, before the days of steam winders and wire ropes and cages, the miners had to get down the face of the cliff, far down nearer to the sea as they could, and then enter by an adit that met the main shaft going down and then continued the journey for 1,800 feet on ladders with various platforms down the shaft. And then if they got to go for a mile underneath the ocean before they actually started work. They must have been some of special men then, men. But the steam winder changed all that. 
This behind me is the mine at Levant, and it went more than 1,800 feet down and then more than a mile under the Atlantic Ocean. Quite an incredible feat, really. And in the little engine house, they've got a winder that I can't wait to have a go on. Hey, you want to have a go? Yeah, certainly. <laughs> What's the first job? Take the break off. Yeah, take the break off. Right. How many turns? Wait a minute. This uh, engine was what were known as the fast winder. It's based on the James Watt beam engine principle that were built by Harvey's of Ale in 1840. And it wound skips of oil from a shaft 1,800 feet deep in five minutes. So up there, you can see the, the great beam rocking up and down. I think it's a bit unusual because the, the pumping engines have half the beam sticking outside into space. This one's all inside the engine house. Down below there, that's the, the condenser, you know, which of course makes the vacuum to, to make the piston go up and down a lot easier. There's approximately 14 pounds per square inch less uh, pressure, you know, against the steam, you know, that makes it work much more economically. That's why Cornish beam engines were very economical. James Watt might be regarded as the father of the steam engine but it was a Cornish man called Richard Trevithick who made some of the greatest advances in the 1790s and early 1800s. Trevithick was born at Elogan near Camborne, but his family soon moved to this cottage here nearby and his father was the manager of the Wheel Chance Copper Mine. Trevithick spent his childhood here and went to the village school with the headmaster uh, his description of him were he's a loafer and inattentive and, and sort of very slow, a bit like me in a way, you know. And he, he, he didn't do well at all, you know. Even his own father said he were a loafer, you know, but he, he spent his time wandering around looking at the tin mines and the machinery of, that existed at the time. He amazed his superiors and so-called men of better education by his unbelievable ability for solving mechanical problems just by his own intuition. By 1790, at the ripe old age of 19 years, he'd already procured quite a few jobs as an engineer at various pits, and his father uh, apprenticed him to Watt's assistant Murdoch, who at that time were erecting all the great pumping engines around the tin mines. And of course, you, you've got to rather think that, that Murdoch taught him all he knew, you know, which gave him a good grounding for the beginning of his great career as an engineer. His greatest advance was to design engines that would work at a much higher pressure than Watts. If you've got an hundred pounds pressure per square inch pushing on a piston rather than about 15, which the earlier engines had, it was going to make the engine much more powerful and efficient. While he was working at the wonderfully named Ding Dong Mines in Penzance, he developed his first high-pressure steam engine, which in the long run led to the development of great big pumping engines like this one here at Cornish Engines in Poole. The main market for the steam engine at this time was industry, and down here in Cornwall there was a huge demand for engines for the mines. Other engineers took up Trevithick's application of high-pressure steam, and Cornish engines became famous the world over, and during the course of the 19th century, they got bigger and bigger. And this is the last of the line of, of Cornish pumping engines on the Taylor shaft, and it was erected in 1924, and it represents like the ultimate in, in mine pumping engineering, which started way back in the days of Newcomen. It ran on a three-shift system with a team of three engine drivers, day and night. I mean, the ginormous size of it. It burned 50 tonnes of coal a week, and it's got a 90-inch diameter cylinder, and it's got a 10-foot stroke. That's incredible. The majority of these great engines were actually made here in Cornish foundries by people like Holman Brothers and Harvey's of Ale who made this very engine. 
by the early days they were exporting them all over the world and of course the Cornish engineers went out and erected the things and quite often stayed there to work the mines as well. Another great idea that Richard Trevithick came up with was the chimney of course which improved the draft on the boilers and, and eventually became quite common in all industrial areas on the skyline. The advances Richard Trevithick made in pumping engines and winding machinery definitely gave Cornwall an unbelievable prosperity in between about 1800 and 1870. But in spite of the great advances that had been made, the steam engine didn't change the fact that mining was still a difficult and dangerous business. And sometimes it was the steam engine itself that made it dangerous. This is the actual shaft head that had the man engine here at Levant. Basically, there were one great wooden pump rod that went right down to the bottom of the shaft. And if the engine had a 10-foot stroke, it had platforms on and two handles that you could get hold of. And then level down the side of this pump rod, there were platforms all the way down at 10-foot centres. And a man stood on the platform holding onto the handles. And as the pump rod descended, when it went down 10 feet, he jumped off onto a platform at the side. All this in the pitch dark with a candle stuck on top of his head. The thing is, here, in 1919, at on this very spot, a terrible accident happened. The man who were in charge of the man engine complained to the management about the fact that there was something wrong with the engine. And if they didn't do so much about it a bit quick, he would leave their employ. Anyway, they didn't do anything about it and he left their employ. And a bit later on, the engine, the, the beam broke, something happened and the rods went down the shaft with all the men on and 36 of them died, you know, got smashed to bits with the timber and the bits of iron and everything that were coming down. And it took four days to dig them all out. So this really is a very sad spot here at Levant. The wall industrial landscape in Cornwall is a bit sad, really. Just about all derelict now, with little trace of the work of Trevithick, who was one of the greatest pioneers of steam. But his development of the Cornish engine wasn't the only thing that made him one of the giants of steam. Trevithick, he never really got true recognition for his contribution to the development of the steam engine. Not only in mining, but steam road transport and railways as well. Because it was his invention of high pressure or strong steam, as he called it, that led to the development of some of the world's first steam-powered locomotives. And his first was designed to run along the road. Trevithick's use of strong steam meant that you could build an engine that weighed about 10 tonnes that would do the same work as an engine that weighed 650 tonnes. And he soon realised that the engine was quite small enough to transport itself along the road. And here at Camborne, they built a reproduction of the Puffin Devil, which is a quite interesting piece of machinery. The engine was pretty simple. A mixture of wood and iron and all blacksmith made. The only drawback was the boiler was too small and the steam couldn't be kept up for long when the locomotive was underway. But it was the first successful high pressure engine constructed on the principle of a moving piston, which was not only raised but depressed by the steam. On Christmas Eve in 1801, he ran this up a hill of several hundred yards, with a few people hanging on it a bit like this. But unfortunately, it burnt out while Trivithick and his mates were having a bit of a booze up to celebrate their success in a nearby inn. <laughs> it's concrete, you know, it's bad news. This first carriage he built was a bit mad looking, but it worked. And encouraged by his success, he went on to build another one that was even madder looking. In 1803, Richard Trevithick built a second road carriage, which he drove around the streets of London. But he soon realised, like the state of the road surface, that the vehicle weren't really up to it, so he abandoned it. 
You can't help but wonder what would have happened if the road surfaces had been like they are today. The history of road transport would have been unbelievably different. This magnificent engine has been made by Mr. Tom Brogdon, sort of a, a chap who I've known for some time. Hello, Tom. And he's constructed this engine more or less on his own from very few drawings, you know, and it actually runs, uh, to me, it's a wonderful creation. But what made you decide to construct such a wonderful thing? Well, my wife, Ruth, yeah. gave me a birthday card, which is of a picture that uh, the Science Museum in London had painted of what they believed this vehicle mm. was like. It intrigued me. Mm. I didn't believe anybody could drive such a vehicle, yeah. and that set me going. And then I, I looked, researched it, I went to mm. the patent office and found yeah. the patent drawings. We don't really claim it, we claim it's built, it's a yeah. Trevithic it car, it's built to his patent. Mm. And I dare say if Richard Trevithic was here now, he'd demand a royalty from me. But, <laughs> but he did carry eight people across London from Holborn to, uh, to Paddington in 1803 mm. and brought them yeah. back the same day. Yeah, yeah, which was so They refused to go yeah. with him again. But that's... <laughs> a bit of an early ride. The carriage will only run forwards. This engine is a high-pressure simple expansion engine which uses a water pump to supply the boiler with water. Mm. Oh, We're losing the fire a bit now, aren't we? Yeah. Can I put some on? <laughs> I know it's blowing off, but as soon as you go, it's Yeah. Good. Well, we'll only put a bit on, just keep it alive, then. Eh? Turn off the front a bit. Eh? Where there are holes, fill the front at holes. Yeah, the front. Trevithick's industrial engines ran at around £100 per square inch, but he only ran this at about 30 because he was worried about it blowing up on the road. Anyway, I'll climb up into the, uh, the driving position. Ah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> really enjoyed that, but you can imagine what it must have been like in, in the olden days, in 1803, when all the roads were full of deep ruts from horse-drawn traffic. I mean, it's all right here on this nice smooth car park, but you can see why Mr. Trivethick abandoned it, you know, and maybe he got to put up with them sort of conditions. So Trivethick turned his attention to developing a steam locomotive that would run on rails. And next week we'll see how this led to the development of the world's first railways.